if you look if you look at a student today at the age of 17 18 when they get out of school the core skill they have is taking exams that's really the core skill they have they really don't have anything i can i can pluck a 17 18 year old and suddenly drop them in a village and the child will not know how to survive right they're probably only going to figure out how to make a payment and buy a ticket and come back Welcome to the Learning Circle, the ultimate video podcast for educators and parents who want to unleash the full potential of children. Join us as we explore the fascinating world of learning with the help of thought leaders who will share their knowledge and stories with us. This is your host Kavleen Kaur and I'm excited to take you on this journey. Get ready to be inspired, informed and entertained. Uh, Mr. Anand Krishnaswamy is a computer scientist who spent a decade and a half in the tech industry creating innovative solutions. Now he is an educator who loves to see a young mind get it. And therefore, he shares this joy of helping children learn with other educators who are equally passionate about a child's learning experience. He spends his time training teachers, designing curricula and coaching school leaders. He writes extensively on educational innovations. It's great to have you on board today, Mr. Anand. Thank you so much, Kathy. It's a pleasure being here. Likewise. So I would uh, start the session with a request uh, to share your professional journey from the corporate world to the educational sector, uh, sharing all the remarkable movements and also the challenging ones. Sure. So actually, my uh, in a sense, my uh, my entry into education was much before my corporate journey started. Right. Uh, so pretty much since my ten, I have been 10, 11, 12, I've been teaching uh, students, younger kids. But this was sort of the teaching that we call tutoring. Right. So there would be uh, younger kids who have. Uh, difficulty with the maths or the science and parents typically would look at your marks and they say oh he's got 99 percent in the cbsc board exams he must be a good student he must be a good teacher so, you know send my kids also over to him and get this thing happening so there would be so i, I, I used to tutor that uh kids um, in in the neighborhood so a lot of uh, kids would come up typically for science and maths right um, occasionally for English, but it was usually science and maths, which is really where most of the kids were struggling. So I had entered education in that sense much before entering into the corporate world. Uh, but then I went ahead and qualified myself as a computer scientist and uh, went into the industry as that too for a while. Uh, but I was also teaching on the side, right? Where I, when I was learn, uh, I was doing my masters at the Pune University Computer Science Department. I was I was teaching at Pune University as well. And after that, I, I've, I've taught a whole semester at um, IIIT Hyderabad. I taught operating systems, though. I was teaching mostly computer science related um, material and content at different places. Even at uh, Bangalore University, there was a program, a satellite program that was done. So I was doing all of that. And I think it's the IIIT experience that uh, made me feel like uh, I need to work at an age where the mind is still receptive in many ways, right? I, I felt that students, when they entered college, there was a chip on the shoulder, and, and that chip on the shoulder was a block to their being receptive. Uh, for instance, like at Triple IT, but there was the, the, the batch was about 95 students. And after a few sessions, I told them, see, attendance is not compulsory, right? Don't worry, I won't report you to your dean or anyone. You don't want to come. Go ahead, don't come. And the next batch, there were only about seven students in the class. The rest of them just didn't come. Uh, and so that's when I kind of started realizing, no, but the seven were really engaged. They genuinely care and they really understood and enjoyed. So this is despite the fact that I was trying to help these students understand. But then the notion was, oh, how do I quickly become the next billionaire? Mm. Right? Uh, but they have to realize that when you have even someone uh, like uh, Zuckerberg who, who started Facebook, he was very good at PHP programming, right? You have to be good in your fundamentals. And the fundamentals are not entertaining. They are seemingly boring. You, 
Just building that muscle is important. Anyway, so then I realized I, I, I preferred working with younger kids and it kept getting progressively younger. Uh, and that's how I got into K-12. So this was still about 2006, 2007. I was largely tutoring and teaching at universities. And then I started focusing more and more on K-12. I was still in the industry, so I was doing this in parallel. So it would be like evening things or weekend uh, events and activities and things like that. So I was enjoying my corporate work. It was, it was an immensely uh, rewarding. The experiences were fantastic. And, uh, as you mentioned, so was, I was busy uh, creating patents and uh, all of that stuff. So it was fun. I was thoroughly enjoying myself. But uh, come 2016, uh, I realized I couldn't do both. Um, and especially I wanted to do really work in the space of education. So 2016, when I was coming, when I was returning to India, before I got on the flight, I sent in my resignation saying that, you know what, I, I, I don't think I can do both of them. And the reason I did that was for the next 19 hours on the flight, you know, nobody could get reach out and tell me, me here is a new project. Why don't you try it out? Because that's what you should get me trapped. Every time there would be something new and I'd feel like, nah, let me do it next. Let me, let me finish this and then get to education. This time I said no. But then, then still some things that I had, I had a freak accident of sorts and I, I stayed on for six more months at the company where I was working. Um, and then I, I completely dedicated myself to K-12 education. But I wanted to understand under-resourced education. So I first did volunteering gigs at various schools in different parts of India. I wanted to understand A, under-resourced education, and B, whether it mattered with geography, did it change with geography? As in, were the problems of South India different from West India, which were different from East India, different from North India? So I was at different places. Um, doing that and, and towards the end of 2017 i was doing a volunteering gig at the school called purkal youth development society uh, this is outside of Dehradun in a village called purkal and uh, i had a fantastic one one and a half months of volunteering there and around that time swami sir was running the school who had established and was running the school he said enough of roaming around and all these fun things that you're doing stay back we have a lot of things to do here so I decided to stay there, uh, started off looking at the STEM education, and then eventually I was taking care of all of academics, streamlined a whole bunch of things, right? So, so it, was, it was four years of crazy day and night work and study and research. I effectively created my own curriculum of what I think was necessary to be a good educator. Right? And, and some of the stuff that you see here, uh, the books from, from that whole study, so I moved from being a multi-dimensional person to a largely mono-dimensional person who was only looking at education, only reading reports, only studying papers, day in and day out. As if there was nothing else that I was doing for those four years stuff in the tech space. But then my heart was always with schools, you know, working with, uh, with children, with teachers. I always wanted. I thought I always wanted to work with children, but then I started realizing that if, if impact matters, you have to sort of move one step above, right? At the same time, I didn't want to go all the way up to, you know, sort of work at the Ministry of Education. Mm. That's too remote. Mm. I wanted to be very near, but also create impact. So I thought it made most sense working with teachers, school leaders and all of that stuff, and also with children. And that's where I am right now. Interesting journey. And yes, and what you told about the importance of K to 12 with respect to higher education is actually very relatable. I think that uh, in K to 12, you either you have a chance to either kill the creativity and love for learning or to nurture it. So absolutely, good. I, I think it's fairly open till even 12. Mm -hmm. I know it keeps dwindling. Yes. Uh, but even in, in grades eight and nine, I've seen children who suddenly, when they are introduced to something, they suddenly feel like, oh, this is so beautiful. I wish I could do this for the rest of my life. Uh, so I wouldn't shut down the option, even in higher education. I don't think we should ever close that. As teachers, we should never close the door. Students, they can, but we can't. But yes, K-12 is... is, is uh, it's a very fertile space. Teachers also. Now coming back to this skill-driven education, what started your interest into this stream? Um, 
how were the seeds sown and uh, where did you see the need for this kind of education vis-a-vis -vis what was being offered traditionally? So, uh, so I was always in the urban space, right? So even my own education has largely been in urban settings, metropolitan, uh, largely urban settings, right? So the, what, what, what we see, we think this is it, this is education. Right? There are textbooks, there are reference materials, there are experts, you learn from them. Right? Uh, and, and education in India is largely very cognitive. And I think it's world over, uh, but let's focus on India for now. And, and the education that I received was very cognitive to the extent that till, um, till 10th grade, I actually had the liberty, even, not even 10th, I think till 9th grade, I had the liberty of doing whatever I wanted, as long as you got the marks. Do whatever else you wanted, right? Then parents, everyone said, you know, forget about other things. We don't have the time to gamble. Focus only on, you know, studies. I don't regret it. I, I realize that it has provided certain kinds of rewards. No questions about it, right? 11th and 12th got even more intense. So, so sports took a backseat. There was no time really to frolic and have fun with friends. It's like, wait up, you know, get back. You have five minutes, get back, all that kind of time schedules and stuff like that. Um, after that, undergraduate, postgraduate, everything was a very focused thing into get landing that amazing job, right? So you're very focused, at least. Uh, I always thought it's the cognitive space is really what matters because the industry really, where, which rewards, is look, is, is your white collar jobs, right? Sorry to interrupt Sorry. there, but you know, I think this you had this uh, um, kind of a shift from the grade 10 onwards, but I think nowadays this shift happens much uh, earlier, right? Earlier. So, it's sad. It is just utterly sad. Yes. Uh, so, even yes. grade 2, grade 3 students have their uh, entire itinerary planned by the parents and uh, teachers, primarily the parents. Yeah. 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 So that happened, and then uh, 11th, 12th, undergrad, postgrad, they all took the same thing, right? So if, they, if at all there were a bunch of students who said, oh, let's go play, they're like, wait, that's going to be one hour, and that one hour I could finish this chapter, why would I do it? Forget it. Let's just focus on studies, right? It was always like that. And it, 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 it ended up, uh, and, it, and it paid off, right? On campus, first day, first uh, organized, we were, at that point, unfortunately, it was the slump time. So it was, the bubble had burst. That companies were not recruiting, still we managed to get some organizations. First day, first organization, both for internship and for the job, I managed to get it. So I, I don't regret that. So that choice paid, but that choice also cost me certain things. And I think it, one needs to be aware of both. One can't suddenly, just because one has gotten a good career, can't suddenly throw that off and say, you know, I lost my youth and childhood and all that. You had advantages, you had things that were lost. But then for me, the realization was learning was largely a cognitive exercise. But over time, both of, uh, in terms of a, a, a sort of philosophical reflection, as well as actually traveling, travel helps, right? Because you get to see a lot of things. And then you see there are people who are skilled. They're amazing at the work that they do. Uh, they might not be able to explain it. They might not be able to give you the Bernoulli uh, theorems or you know all those principles and all, but they know what they do. Right. And it's around that time that I started thinking that, wait, it's that uh, intelligence can't be monodimensional. And that's when I started studying more about, you know, multiple intelligences and, and also went into the space, which is still fairly, is still fairly nascent, which is embodied uh, mind and embodied cognition. Like right? we're not talking about everything happening here, but we're really looking at the entirety of the body. Uh, and how that can actually factor it, right? Uh, so while getting into all of that space, I started interacting with a lot of people, a lot of different thinkers, philosophers, educators, uh, pedagogists, and I uh, definitely, and it's impossible not to stumble upon Mahatma Gandhi's Naitali, for instance, right? Uh, and even uh, Krishna Kumar, who's, uh, you know, the ex-director of NCRT out here, a fantastic thinker and educator, and and some of his things. But I came upon Krishna much later on, 
Naitani, while it immediately struck me as something fantastic, I said, wait, that seems, it still felt reactive. So I said, okay, how do we combine all of these things and make it sustainable, make it something that's uh, relevant, irrespective of the era in which we are, right? And that's when I started sort of moving, however you look at it, deeper, up, higher, sideways, direction is a different thing, but moving in different dimensions to realize that, wait, it's not all, it's not supposed to be all cognitive, right? And the minute you make that statement, you're suddenly including a range of children, not just uh, the ones who are intellectually fantastic and were able to go into abstract thinking and answering question papers and stuff like that. You're suddenly now including other children, the children who are very good at sports, the children who are very good with arts, children who are very good with their hands and building things are able to, uh, you're suddenly including a lot and you're saying, wait, wait, it seems like we're going in the right direction. But Instead of just making a statement like, oh, it's not all cognitive, what is it then? If it is not only cognitive, what is it? Right? That's an important question to answer. Yes. And in doing that, I started uh, seeing that there is a lot, again, as I was saying, there's a lot of intelligence that someone can have in their hands. And I, when I started observing sportsmen and how the kind of decisions that they were making, mm -hmm. right? So when we say that uh, Tendulkar played a masterful stroke, and you actually just go back all the way from when the ball was released by the bowler, you realize the bowler deciding to pitch it was also a decision, saying that, wait a second, I think Tendulkar is going to try this shot, so let me confuse him with this kind of a pitch or a you know swing or whatever. And it's also the Tendulkar watching the ball pitch, figuring out where it's coming, and then quickly figuring out the stroke. Now this, if you were to do it very, very algorithmically or with a flow chart, the ball is gone way past you. It's it's not you don't have that luxury of time. So these are like microsecond decisions that are being made, and if they are not being done here, there is some other intelligence that we need to understand and incorporate, right? So when I so when I was going in and I'm sort of mulling over these things and all that, and that's when I realized that there is skill that is important. Skill has to be also given uh, and attributed the kind of a first level citizenship as cognition and cognitive thing and abstract thinking, etc. Right? And that served a particular industry. Right? Skill is becoming so uh, it's considered so common and you know popularly available, it's not being treated with that much respect. Right? But today, if I were a master craftsman at Ladro or any of these fantastic places, you are a rarity. You are, or a painter, uh, you're a rarity, right? So skill and skill development also should be given. That was one side. The other thing I was looking at the reality of things, right? And and I've I've written and I've uh, spoken about this often. If you look if you look at a student today at the age of 17, 18, when they get out of school, the core skill they have is taking exams. That's really the core skill they have. They really don't have anything. I can I can pluck a 17, 18 year old and suddenly drop them in a village and the child will not know how to survive, right? They're probably only going to figure out how to make a payment and buy a ticket and come back home, right? The ability to say, sorry, there is no home, nothing. You have to figure out something to do in that village. Uh, some kids will hack it, right? But most of them will not, they don't have a skill by which they can offer something and be of use, right? So this is one realization. And I'm saying, wait, if you want skill development to have or be treated as a first class citizen, it cannot be an afterthought. It cannot be a response to me not being good in cognitive subjects or cognitive activities or tasks, right? So today what happens is you and I um, at grade eight or grade nine, the teacher looks at you and me and says, you know, Kavin is very good and she scores very highly in all of these exams so she's able to do this abstract thinking and uh, cognitive processes are good for her anand is not so let's send anand to vocational courses right and then from there starts a whole degradation of this first of all i'm sent there not because i'm good at vocation i'm sent there because i'm bad at cognitive thinking right right, right. It's right. someone saying oh, you can't dance at all why don't you become a plumber it's like, wait, what has dance got to do with plumbing? As in they're, they're, how did you figure that part out? 
But then I, I'm sent to plumbing just because of that. It's like, oh, you can't dance. Why don't you fly a kite? Or you can't dance. Why don't you go join the army? Like they're highly, there doesn't seem to be a correlation. Hmm. So I'm not good at cognitive, so go to vocational, which doesn't make sense. Second is, okay, you go to vocational, I'm not even being treated well in the vocational space. I'm not being given a top class institute in vocational space. I'm basically sent to a place where normally nobody else comes. So teachers don't come or if the teachers come, they themselves are not very highly enthusiastic or whatever. And that then is a spiral downward. I'm not of much use. I don't get, I might get some manual labor job or some kind of a fitter's job or something of that sort. So I'm not, so whereas you would have gone on to the top institutes, there is something called a top institute to aspire for you. I don't have anything to aspire to. I'm just going to aspire to you know, somehow get a job. Hmm. You are not threatened by that. You're like, oh, I just have to go to that institute and then jobs will just pour my way. So your path, so I've been given a very stepmotherly treatment, right? And this is sort of the class fairy tale stepmother. I'm sure there are good stepmothers too. But I think the stepmotherly treatment that I'm getting out here is that just go do some of this, hmm. sort of get out of my scene or my screen. I don't want to see you. And you are now somebody else's problem, right? So that's the second thing. So when I'm seeing all of these simultaneously, I'm saying, wait a second, there has to be a way to solve this problem, right? And at that point, what I've stumbled upon as a solution, typical model that schools adopt, and I think most places would adopt, is when they get a list of things that you have to teach or do, right? They keep allocating sessions and periods for that, right? So what when you said, oh, maths is extremely important. So they'll have math every day. You say language is extremely important. You'll have language. So it's like, a, in my head, I call that the sandwich model. So you have the basic bread, which is get them to school. And then you have maths, you know, a source of maths done. Then you have some uh, tomatoes of uh, language done. And then you have another, uh, you know, cheese of art. And then I need to have uh, sports. So I'll have that. So you just keep on layering. And then if to, if tomorrow the NCRT were to come up and say, oh, cooking is extremely important, please ensure your children do have, have at, you know, are uh, engaged in cooking. The schools will essentially try to somehow squeeze something, find one more period or two, and then they'll do cooking. So, and then my sandwich becomes so big, I can't even open my mouth to eat the sandwich, which is where the teachers suffer. They say, oh, wait a second, we're not able to complete the syllabus and you're just adding sessions on top of sessions and you're re reducing the sessions that we require. How do we ever do that? Now, skill-driven education is very clear. It's, it's not at all prescribing this. What we're saying is, let a class learn a skill, right? And the skill is very localized. Each place has a different set of skills, right? Now, I might be in a remote village in Gujarat where pottery is a trade. So pottery might be the skill I want to focus on for the for half of the month, right? So we'll bring in the potter. The potter works with the children. The teachers are working with the potter and the children, and they're learning how to make a pot, right? First, just simply slapping it, slapping it, and making a container. The next is on the wheel and how to spin, how to throw on the wheel, how to spin, all of that stuff, right? And in 15 days or so, the kids will pick it up. Guaranteed. This has been done and demonstrated, they've done it. So at the end of these 15 days, right, let's just take a, a, a sort of a, let's say the school shuts down. Drastic, dramatic thing, right? School shuts down and these kids are not allowed to get into any school. We realize that the kids at least have a skill with them. Now, if you did the same thing with cognitive stuff, it doesn't work that way because things get assembled over time, right? So if I suddenly stop at the end of the chapter on adding two integers, that's all you can do. And that's not of much use to anyone. Whereas here I have a skill. I can at least go ahead and become a potter. So that's my first realization. Then I'm saying, we've all done this pot building of pots together. So there was a shared context. There is no reason why I, as a teacher, cannot talk about well, if I want a bigger pot, do I need more clay, less clay? If this size pot came out of this much, if I want to make twice the size of a pot, would I need this much? I'm already talking math, I'm talking proportion, I'm talking additive concepts, I'm getting to multiplicative concepts. I can teach all of my math concepts in the context of pottery. You could talk, you could get into mensuration. Depending on the shape of the pot that you build, the volume of it will differ. 
I can get into all of those things, right? I can talk about surface area. How much paint would I require for, you know, getting this spot paint? So surface area, volume, all of that stuff gets covered. Again, if you want to get into multiplication and revision and ratio proportion, all of those things, can, a lot of my maths can be covered, right? If not all of maths, right? My, my personal belief is that anything that we do on a day to day basis is the reason why we are learning maths and science and English and history and everything, right? Else, why would we learn? So, hmm. at least this is two of the, at least the first K 10, right? 11th, 12th honors, we are doing things which are different, but let's just focus on K 10 for now. So, in the concept, in the story of pots, I, I can create so many stories. My language studies, and I'm translating it from, say, if I, this is Gujarat still, I translate it from Gujarati to Hindi to English. I can do all these language juggling and application and learn very core language skills while building pots. Science of materials, of heat, how does heat harden it? Why is it that, you know, you, you need a proportion of water in this? What is the science of elasticity or plasticity? All of those things I can talk about, right? Right. The geography of the soil that we are using for pot. Where is this come? Which is a better soil? Why is that soil like this? Why is the soil near the river different from the soil away? All of those things also I can talk. So just pottery, I can cover the breadth of the subjects typically mm -hmm. that I've talked about. Mm -hmm. So I'm not... Adding it, I'm saying in while doing pottery, let's talk about all the math, science, English language, la la la, all of that stuff related in the context of pottery. But because it's a shared experience, because you and I are both doing it, there is no question of me ever coming and telling you, ma'am, when will we ever use this thing? Hmm. We are using it right. So your this question that children typically would ask, why are we studying this? When will we ever use it? Will never arise because I'm learning it then and then. I'm doing it. I'm using it. I'm studying stories and uh, about, about how you know something happened to a pot or any of those kinds of things. Right? And I'm doing the math of pottery and pot and all of this stuff really in real time. I'm adjusting the quantity of the clay, everything in real time. The amount of heat, I'm getting the science of heat, etc. All of that stuff in real time, right? So in those 15 days, I am also studying these things while building because there is no reason that I have to do it. Like a train, bogey after bogey after compartment after coach, right? I can very well do it in while I'm doing it. So the skill driven, that's why it's not skill based or skill inclusion or something. It is skill driven. The skill is driving my maths and sciences and language requirements. Then I move on to picking up another skill. Let's just pick, just for the sake of, you know, uh, variety. Let's say I'm going to do uh, something like repairing of bicycles. Or maybe even festooning a flower garland, which is quite a South Indian thing, right? So you have those things. Are there's enough of math, science, history, uh, uh, literature context in each of these things? There are stories where you know we've had the protagonist get swayed a decision because of the, the scent of the flowers that were blooming. There's so many such things. It's a very rich space, and you're also including the community, the lady who does this garlanding or the gentleman who does it, they come and they share how they've been doing it down the ages. Why do they use banana fiber? Why do they use a particular thing? How, why is it uh, sustainable? It's no longer some plastic thing that they're using to do. That's not sustainable. But banana fibers or jute fiber, they're sustainable. We are automatically talking about a lot of things that come together. Now, in this, while you're learning these subjects, and all, there is no reason you can't do a project-based exercise also. Right. Go ahead, do a practice yeah. learning exercise also. But this is skill development. So if you notice, if I do 15, 15 days, even if I did one, one skill per month, let's just say, at the end of an academic year, I definitely have 10 skills with me. At the end of 12 years, I have 120 skills that I can take to the market and actually do something with it. Versus a student who only knows how to take tests today. Right. 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 So that is, and, and the, 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 that's one thing. The second is, as I said, since I'm relooking cognitive skill development from these skills, this question of where will I use it, what is the relevance of what I'm learning, all of that goes away. I'm and I'm repeatedly learning the same thing, perhaps in different contexts. 
today it was in farming tomorrow it is in uh, bicycle third day it is in watch and uh, you know horology uh, fourth day it is in something else so but it's the same thing and hence my my mind is expanding amazingly to be able to see the same cognitive concept in so many dimensions along so many skills right right and yes and you're also including the community now Hmm. So that means the community is invested in the education of hmm. future set of students. It's not just a school, right? Right. To share an anecdote, we had a case where there were two girls who were studying in our school, and uh, their father was the school electrician. Hmm. Right. Every day, all that the girls had seen was their father come and you know, fit some bulb or fix some wiring or something. For the rest of the kids also, it was sometimes like a joke, oh, their father's just an electrician. And, and they would like touch them and say, oh, chocolate, yeah, 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 and all those kinds. So, you know how kids are, right? Yeah. One, uh, not as a response to that, because this is definitely my agenda as well, so is like I, I invited him to teach groups of students and different grades and different classes how to set up, you know, the basic electrical wiring of a room. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. And he was very happy. Felt like, yes, sir, I would love to do it. I said, do it. And he was in his element because this is his area. Yeah. He just knows it. Yeah. Right. He doesn't need to refer a book or check whether this is the right definition. He doesn't need any of that stuff. He is the king of his area, right? So, and when he did that, uh, first of all, he felt a sense of value and pride in his work. The students learned so much. Now they know that they can always open up something and fix the wiring, etc. These girls also started feeling a new respect for their father and the father's trade. Their classmates started respecting them, saying, oh, you know, you're actually your father's top brass. He really knows a lot of stuff. It, the community shifts. There's a lot of such things that happen when we include the community in and, and help them drive the education. We are saying, see, you have a skill. You know something. Let's use that. Our skill is to extract cognitive stuff from things. Hmm. So I am a math teacher. I am a science teacher. My skill is to look at anything and see science and maths in it. Hmm. So when you, let's say you are a earring designer and you show how to do the metal thing and how you do all of that stuff, hmm. you know you're, you're talking your jargon. You're talking your language. Right, but while doing that, we talk about malleability, ductility, and how different metals have got this, and how something yeah. is brittle. I can talk about all of those things, mm -hmm. and in the math, I can talk about you know how much material is required, and what is the volume, and how can you charge per unit volume, and how the hence the rate of different earrings. I can do that. I can talk about like a story. Of course, that's a flip. That's a ring that went off. But Shakuntala story you could also talk about how like earrings went, and you have a whole story right. around how. You know, earrings yeah. for the center yeah. of that. Story. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, What we are saying is essentially we start from a skill which is uh, primarily non-cognitive. It is generally driven by some physical, you know, it's more of a physical skill. And uh, we start from there, but we integrate aspects of cognitive dimensions. We integrate the cognitive dimensions That's into that. Word. I would say okay. integrate. I'd say we extract. Okay. dimensions of cognitive learning okay See, I'll give you an example. if you say gardening right and we have decided to learn how to plant and tend to let's say grapes hmm. now, grapes means i have to have a framework for the vines to grow right right there's a particular season in which they will grow right now growing grapes i cannot talk about you know the redwoods and stuff like that hmm. or you can but it'd be too much of an extra uh, extrapolation hmm. whereas in this context of grapes, whatever I can pull out and learn, the math of it, the science of it, you know, how it has got a particular growth structure, why is that shape the way it grows, all of that is particular to grapes. Right. That converse, I cannot have when I'm talking about mangoes. Mm. That's a different context. Right. So, right. which is why I would say you're extracting cognitive dimensions rather than integrating. Integrating has a slightly forceful nature to it. Mm. Extraction is that it emerges. It's an emergent thing right. from the context. Right, right, right. Okay, that's a, that's a nuance that I had missed. So thanks for sharing that. Yes. And normally when we talk about a PBL project-based learning or a hands-on learning, this is what we follow the, the integrated approach wherein we are trying to, uh, you know, we, we'll say that we'll integrate a, 
mathematics into the session into the project that you are doing so and so forth so this is a sli uh, slightly different approach um, then uh, you know coming back to you mentioned that uh, this is a uh, this has a localized context you pick up a skill uh, which is uh, used and uh, prevalent in that local area, which is uh, wonderful. Uh, that That's the way to start. Uh, but then how do we, uh, you know, make it more of a uh, children prepare for a global context, uh, uh, if you understand what I mean? Because they may be learning 10 skills, which they see everybody using it around them and which is wonderful, right? But from there, how do we help them develop an appreciation of the, uh, different skills people in other parts of the country were maybe maybe practicing right and uh, uh, and if we if we plan to do that then how do we actually do that uh, develop that because we may not have you know teachers and um, uh, educators who are trained on that and in fact I'm going into a altogether a different area of uh, teacher professional development of teachers uh, we'll we'll go there as well, but like you know, what how how can we build a global context in uh, this skill driven education? Right. So let's start with the existing reality. Today, forget about global skills. You don't even have local skills. <laughs> right. So my you kid, overlook. Uh, fact, I would say I would say that we uh, overlook the local skills. We deliberately, you know. Uh, uh, maybe even so look down, maybe even look down upon the the local skills, right? And so so uh, if we are going back, yeah, and some schools will probably do a, you know like a weekend project or an exhibition with something that they have picked up, etc. Right? Hmm. They are, and they will say, hence we are doing skill development. My point is that we are not talking about skill development. We are talking about skill driven, which means if the Bidri style of work or if there is some other thing that's a local craft for your area. After having picked up the skill, are you situating cognitive development in that skill? Are you extracting cognitive from it? If you're not doing that, it is not skill driven. It is only skill addition mm. to the various things. Right? Because of that, what happens is, again, there's just no connection. I learned a skill, it's there, but the fact that it has got to do with the oxidation process that we are talking about in later classes, I will not even connect these two. Right? I'm like, how huh, skill, skill was done there, oxidation process or whatever else, and these things are in some other class. Right? Uh, whereas when I'm doing this, and I'm saying we will study what was done in order to get the black finish, and I'm saying that that happens because of oxygen. Without oxygen, without oxidation, it's not possible. I have arrived at oxidation because we were studying this particular skill. You get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. So, so the first point I would like to realize in your question is that the local skills are in, today itself are not happening. So what we are doing is definitely one step more than what exists. Mm. So today we are at a zero. We are definitely at a one if we did only the local skills. Right. Second, uh, if you if this became a, a, a phenomenon by which you know globally everyone understands the value of this, then you uh, there is no reason why you cannot have exchange programs where I take my skills elsewhere right. and someone brings their skills here. Right. Right. So that's the second aspect that I look at. Now the third could be someone who say, oh yeah, that is all only for very rich schools. We are not someone who can do that. Uh, the thing is that, at least when I was growing up, there used to be a lot of cultural exchange uh, events that used to happen, right? There would be, as, especially like the Russian festival that would happen, and we'd have Russian artisans come and teach. Even recently, there's a lot of Japanese artisans who still come periodically. Delhi is one definite place, and the metros are definitely other places. They come and do this. There is no reason why we can't collaborate and have experience to learn this. This would be my third thing. The fourth would be that, that yeah, even that is only available up to B towns and B cities. I am a, I am a school in a particular village, uh, and and I am not getting that luxury. You know, I don't have that luxury of uh, traveling or exchanging students and all. But I still have an aspiration of picking up global skills. Mm. Right? How do I then get my students to pick up global skills? Right, 
And again, let's just take a very clear cut example so that we don't know we're not talking hypothetically. Let's say we have picked up the skill of weaving, right? So a loom, how to run, you know, set up a loom, the web, uh, web of the wall, everything. How do I do it? How do I change patterns? How do I make patterns? All of that is there, right? That's one. Now there is a different style of looming that is being used, let's say, in the Norwegian countries, right? Or Scandinavian countries, or Norwegian, Scandinavian countries, right? There is no reason why I cannot set up a video call with them and a video program with them to have this thing done, right? Let's take it one step further. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to go to the extreme. Now, now, let's say there is a school that says, you know what, this is only possible for schools which have a internet connection. I am a school that doesn't even have an internet. But I still want to learn these things. You cannot deny me that. So how are you going to enable me to get it? And I'm like, there are, I will just essentially get these programs downloaded, set up on a DVD or something, bring it to your school, you watch, you learn from them, and you have local uh, centers of excellence that exchange, and there might be this one hub school which has got an internet connection that will help you out and do it. Right. So this is all the way till the, you know, but school which is under a bridge kind of a place, every place can participate in this. Nevertheless, let's just take the worst case. We're still not able to do this. I would say first invest in getting the skill driven things so perfectly done for your 12 years of your kids. Your kids are already set up to pick, look at any skill across the world and know how to extract the necessary science and maths and English and history and geography from it. Which today no child has today a child if i gave you a child a leather pouch the child does not know how to approach it from all of these angles and actually extract all that is required mm. whereas these kids have 12 years of experience doing only that over and over and over again so they cannot look at an object and not deconstruct it into all of these things they have been trained to do that and from such a young age so it's in their blood now Whereas we will always require somebody else to train us to, you know, do these things till we can actually decompose, or, you know, break down a machine and, you know, look at things and be able to do right. all of that stuff. Right, 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 right. So, you know, in fact, then the shared context you talked about becomes a global, you know, because we are, uh, yeah, we are not just limited to local uh, skills, we are uh, globalizing the skills, right? Uh, that brings me to another question about, you know, you, you just talked about that throughout K-12, to they, they uh, you know, their skills are developing. Uh, in this particular approach, how do, uh, how do we scaffold the skills? And let's say we talk about pottery. A grade one student would be barely able to, you know, manage or make a, make a pot and all that. He would not understand the volume. He may understand about the surface area a bit, not about the volume and all that. So how do you propose to, you know, take a child through that particular skill and build on, you know, various cognitive dimensions and even the various physical dimensions, right? Because uh, a child, a grade one child would be able to create a basic shape, a grade five child would be able to create more intricate uh, shapes. So is it, is it the scaffolding possible in this approach? And if so, how do we do it? Okay, so here's the thing, right? Now, I will not try to teach mensuration to a grade one child. Yeah. Right? Which means what I can do as a skill reveals what I can extract as cognitive elements for that child. Mm. Right? So, there is all that I'm able to do is this. And hence, I will talk, push, abstract only certain elements. Mm. Right? Uh, Largely in grade one, if they are able to build a little pot or something, I'll immediately extract it into you know making little more items and then having a show and tell game or a story making, right. all of those kind of things. And then I might try to say that wait a second, why is this not good to hold say water? Those kind of conversations, yeah. right? I'm not good at talking very high level abstracting mm -hmm. concepts. Uh, so the choice of skill that I would bring in at a grade level is is um uh, is your as it since it is the context you need to pick which skill development you would like to introduce mm. being ripest for the kind of concepts i wish to talk about let me then just wrap up this part particular thing that you're talking about yeah 
skill is the context yeah. right it's like how you will not take a grade one child to a high level science museum mm. uh, or you will not take a grade one child like it's, it's even like how as parents we decide right where do we go for vacation like if there is a place which is extremely expensive and it's very rich with things we'll wait for the child to grow up so that the child can remember that experience yes. right yes. we will not take yes. grade one as sitting in india for instance i will not take uh, a three-year-old child of mine or a four-year-old child of mine to new york i will not because they're not going to remember most of it and it's such an expensive trip i might as well wait till the child turns 14 15 or something yeah. 12, whatever it is right? it's the same thing with skill so you have to curate the skills and the skills are available throughout. You have a whole range. What are those skills? So I would say for grade one space, largely gardening, building little, little tools and toys and assembling things and those kind of things are good skills to have. Flower arranging, for example, right? Uh, that's a good skill to develop. Very simple, right? I have a pot, I have different kinds of flowers. There's an aesthetic sense that's developing, there's patterning that's developing, there's a lot of those. Tessellation, as one might call it, it might just be something you can do here. Right? So you need to curate the right set of skills for the right age. That is one. The other aspect is which skill is, is a fertile ground for lots of conversation and lots of cognitive skill extraction. Mm. Right? That's an important thing also to look at. Mm. Right? Look at, for instance, watch repair. Mm. Right? Agreed that most people are just looking at their phones and seeing time, telling time. Uh, but let's see, let's just say we want to do, and kids love it. They would love it when you open up and you show them gears and, you know, yeah. the jewels and all of that stuff, the mechanical clock. Uh, when you show them that and then you get them to repair, the, the infinite space of what I can talk about just in that context um is mind-blowing i can go all the way back in history to time to philosophy to literature to time travel which is science fiction and everything all just in that one watch that is there yeah right yes, yes. you're talking about gears you're talking about springs you're talking about the, the, the mechanics the science everything is just it's crazy so but we need to pick it a grade one kid might not understand and or appreciate it and then their fingers are not ready for that kind of uh, delicate operation also uh, a grade 8 kid might like it and there is no reason that a skill introduced once cannot be met, revisited exactly right? so, yeah you might be pottery at grade 1 which is just clay assembly hmm. and then again at grade 3 hmm. when you're doing a little more big uh, you know bigger objects and stuff and then again a grade 7 and then again a grade 10 there's no reason you can't do it that way right uh, so skill has to be this, this is a curation that's involved. As much as you would have a, a syllabus design and a curriculum design, there is also a skill sequencing design. Right. And, and it also depends on what you have locally. Not everyone has a potter locally, for example. Right, right. In which, what do I do? So those kind of things would be that. Yeah. What is skill-driven education? Now that's extremely important to understand because there's a lot of other variations which seem very close to it and can call, lead to confusion. Mm -hmm. There is skill-based education. Mm -hmm. There is skill uh, education as one of the things that we offer. Right? I also offer music, dance, and other things, and I'm also offering skill mm -hmm. development. Right? There are all of these variations where skill-driven education is very clear in its intent and purpose, is that skill-driven education recognizes two very important pieces. Number one, when we have a shared experience, we, we have something to exchange and I get the, uh, I have the agency and I have the authenticity to then learn because I've experienced something. I want to learn more about something because I've experienced, right? So that's point number one. So I'm creating a shared experience, right? The second, is that all cognitive, non-cognitive uh, elements that need to be uh, learned, studied, and then gone into are derived from that particular skill and the experience around of, uh, the acquisition of that skill. Okay. These are two very important aspects of skill driven. If these two are there, then it is skill driven. Right? 
Now, why are both of these important? Today, we talk about experiential learning, right? Which means we want the child to experience. But what are we doing is that we're forcing the child to experience something that normally they were not experiencing, hmm. right? So for example, I will suddenly take the child into a lab and get them to do some kind of acid-based reaction. That's not what I was normally doing on a day-to-day -day basis, right? But you you calling that experiential or you 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 make it experiential or whatever for me. So you are, in summary, you are creating your you're adding new things which normally I wouldn't have experienced. That is one. The second is all the other things that I was experiencing. You're telling me you, you know leave that at home. Mm. That's not what I'm going to study. So you're now confusing me. You are not. You're saying, wait, some are to be done experientially, but the other things that I experienced, let's not talk about them. Right? Right. Then the third problem right. that then comes, when I say, okay, can we all have a shared experience? Then the thing becomes, oh, wait a second, how can we do it? Urban or rural school? There mm -hmm. are 30 kids in the class. They're all going to have their different experiences. How could we possibly have one common experience? There are only some very fundamental things. Like, oh, it was raining yesterday, so all of them experienced rain. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a food shortage and hence everyone is experiencing food shortage or whatever it is right that is why the skill development is important we have a skill development experience mm -hmm. how it is shared how everybody's experiencing the teacher the student the the skilled community leader everybody is coming in and experiencing it together mm. and hence now we can clearly say this was a shared experience right so you start with that. So now this is genuinely experiential. I have experienced something. I had fun. I had I had a fight with someone. I had an argument with someone. My thing didn't turn out well, so I'm feeling low. All of these things are happening in the space of skill development. So the context, the shared context is hence important. But now that I have a shared context, and now that I have experiences that I've genuinely experienced, mm -hmm. And why are these things also, why do I say local is important? Because when I go out of the school, on the way to home, I'm seeing a potter there. I'm seeing someone who is, uh, you know, festooning garlands out there. I am seeing someone who's repairing a bicycle there. I am seeing someone who's tending the cows out there. Right. I am seeing right. someone who's, you know, maybe uh, building something and, you know, doing something machinery and all of that stuff. So these are things that are my experience and I'm now being allowed to bring them into school and develop a skill. So that's a shared context. Piece. Mm. The second thing is, is to situate the cognitive things in the experience. Now that I have experienced this, what are the questions I want to ask of my experience? Wait a second, why is this material used, not that material? So now we talk about materials. Why is this quantity, why is it not growing in that rate? Mm. Now we can talk about the maths of it. We can talk about the, the, the language uh, elements of it. How do you translate between? Why is this as an expression okay in Hindi, but this expression doesn't exist in English mm. or in the other that we're talking about, right? So we have all of them. Where is this coming from? What are the historical things? How long ago have we had things like this being developed? Mm. How old is the skill? And what is the geographic um, specificity of the skill development? What are the peculiarities of this thing? All of that can be talked about. Hmm. Versus today, you come to sixth grade, hence I am teaching you, let's say, about the uh, the Roman Empire, let's just say. There is nothing that I experienced for which you taught me the Roman Empire. I have not experienced anything. Hmm. And then you have to make it experiential, so we'll take you to a museum. It's like, wait, I'm not experiencing it. You have decided that you have to teach Roman Empire. Hence, you're taking me there. Now, what is the reason, for example, let's say we brought in, let's say we brought in a, a chai gala, a person who makes tea or a tea expert or whatever. Maybe we are in Darjeeling, right? So we want to talk about the various teas and all of that stuff. Now, I'm we get into the skill of brewing tea. What is the reason that I cannot study the history of tea? And in the process of studying the history of TSA, while this was happening, there were adjoining, there were wars happening, there was this development that happened, all of these things I can talk. Hmm. I now have a timeline of T on which I'm situating other events, right? That is not permissible today in history study. 
Today we will study what the textbook tells us and only in that order without actually necessarily situating it and simultaneously seeing, okay, when this happened, what else was happening throughout the world? It's like as if the Roman Empire was happening and everybody was sitting there watching the Roman Empire happen. That was not true. They were busy with their lives, right? What was their life like? Nobody's talking about that in history classes, right? Whereas here you could do that. Hmm. So what I'm trying to say, there are two elements uh, to bring back to the definition. Skill-driven education focuses on skill acquisition by which we create a shared context of acquiring the skill, experiencing the skill, demonstrating the values of that skill and the products that you can create out of the skill, so on and so forth. So that's the shared context. Hmm. But once that is done, the other element is to extract cognitive skills and cognitive concepts and elements and all of that stuff from this shared context. Hmm. When these two happen, then that is clearly uh, the markers of skill-driven education. Right. Did that help? Yes, yes. So that is a very, um, you know, concise definition of uh, skill-driven education. And you have shared several uh, examples of, uh, you know, how to approach that. And the way I see it, like you were mentioning, suddenly, you know, our students are asked to read about the Roman Empire, wherein, you know, they have never experienced that, wherein in this newer approach, skill-driven education approach, there would be a journey towards that period, right? Why we are talking about the Roman Empire, what is what, what we started from the current uh, age, the current time uh, in a particular context, and then we journey from there into the, uh, you know, the history. So then the students are able to relate that, uh, are even able to experience that, right? So I see a lot of uh, lot of value therein, and uh, you know the learning force. Student centric, student centric, right? This moves towards that because in my, what I'm experiencing, I will make this and say, wait, if this mud is what is used, what about in that country where this mud is not there? Yeah. And then the teacher exposes me and shows me and takes me. Okay, let's see how we find out. Let's see what were they using for a cup, for a bowl, for a plate. And we go that way, you know, and then we talk about how our, let's say cotton, right? Cotton or the kind of muslin that was made here was not made elsewhere. Yeah. Which is why trade routes happen. Right. And they said, you know what, you can't make it. So let's go buy it from there. And that's where we start talking about trade routes. We talk about the silk route. We talk about so many things, right? Those then now become organic. Now I understand why we needed a trade route. Rather than saying trade route was there, you might as well just accept that a trade route was required. Mm -hmm. Today I realize I have something which you will not have sitting 10,000 miles away. Hence you need a route to take my thing there. And that is how, but let's say it got too heavy. So the person kept selling all the way through. And that is how the culture of this thing spread and how you will notice that language and food and everything. It's a, it's a, it's a, it doesn't suddenly change, not even in India, right? If I move from even within states, it slowly changes. And then someone tells you, you've moved into the next state. And then you're like, oh, I'm now in the next state. Whereas the food, the clothing, everything slightly gradually changes. Right? All of this is now possible if you do it in a skill-based way. Right, right. How do you see this type of education fitting into the current scenario uh, where technology is everywhere, where, uh, you know, a lot of things are given and, uh, uh, you know, a child may not be able to uh, uh, really um, appreciate or even understand that, you know, uh, 50 years ago, people were living without mobile phones. Right. So, so in this particular scenario, how do you think this kind of education can fit in? And also, you know, have this connect, uh, have this uh, connect of a child with the current time, right? Uh, what I mean to say is that helping him prepare for the current time, helping him fit him or her fit in the current time, understand the technology, be able to use it and also contribute towards creation of this technology, but also, you know, doing it in the context of a particular skill. So let me uh, bring in sort of multiple aspects, right? Firstly, 
the thing that I've always said, as technology keeps on growing and now AI and all of that stuff happening, the one conversation that will keep getting louder is, okay, if all of this can do things that I am doing or can mimic me or can replace me or can overcome me or whatever you want to uh, uh, the one conversation that I think will keep becoming louder is that, okay, wait a second, then what is being human? Right. Yes. And in that context, I think there are only three things. Sorry? Yeah. No, 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 no. Please carry on. Sorry. So one, one conversation that you'll keep hearing is, how do I beat the machine? Mm. And that's, a, that's, a, that's a losing conversation. You cannot beat the machine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But there is this conversation, wait a second, if this also can be done by a machine, if this is also so beautifully done, what then is the essence of being human? Mm. We used to say five years ago, 10 years ago, oh, we can write poetry, what, which machine can write poetry? We can paint a picture, what machine? Now already it's being done. Mm. AI is doing it. Yes. And even original work, to the extent that they're winning prizes against other human beings, yes. right? In poetry and yes. all that. So then we, we have to be drawing within to understand, okay, then what is it that is human, right? Uh, a lot of teachers at sort of in a very um, helpless or a slightly desperate way, they will say, no, 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 you can't lose the human touch. And I'm like, fair, can you please tell me where is that human touch operative in education, in the whole education space? And they're struggling. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying, but we need to understand before we just have a blanket statement like human touch, right? So that is the same thing as saying, what is it that is essentially human that a machine will not be able to provide? In that, I see there are three things that machines, that is essentially human. One is the experiencing. I give you a, uh, an ice cream, which is a vanilla flavored ice cream. I can build a machine to detect it as a vanilla ice cream. I cannot build any machine that will experience the joy or whatever of eating of an ice cream. So the experience cannot be uh, outsourced. You have to experience it. Yeah. That is essentially. And even if both of us have the same vanilla ice cream, you and I are going to experience it vastly differently. Right. You will have memories brought in, which I have never even been part of. I will have memories and reactions and bodily reactions, which you are never part of. Right? So our experience is unique. It is essentially human. That's number one. The second is, let's say we finished eating the uh, vanilla ice cream, right? Or maybe it's a movie we watch. It could be anything, right? Whatever we experience is uniquely ours. What we reflect on that experience is uniquely ours. Hmm. You cannot have a machine reflect for you. Hmm. Right. You can no amount of data provided to the machine can make it reflect for you. The fact that you heard something, you smelled something, and it brought back the memory of your grandmother, and then from there it took you to that bus you were waiting for to go to your grandma's, all of that is not possible for a machine to do. It cannot do it. Your reflection, your reminiscing, all of that is exclusively yours. It is uniquely human. The third and the final piece is the spirit of Kavli, the spirit of honor. That is you. That is me. I, nobody else can have that spirit. They can align with that spirit. They can join with that spirit. They can collaborate with that spirit, but they cannot have that spirit. Hmm. That spirit is me. That spirit is you. Right. In my opinion, okay, I, I'm not a neuroscientist or a cognitive psychologist or anything, but in my sort of um, mulling and reflection, I think these three will remain uniquely human. And our education should focus on these things. Hmm. The more we try to only build up skills on technology, the more we will have things that are become redundant or uh, replaceable. Right? Hmm. These things will continue to be relevant forever and will then make the rest of our functioning more centered, more rooted, more clear in our head. We are not reacting. We understand why we are doing something because we have a good grasp over these three. Right.
Right. Now this is someone might dismiss this as just pure philosophy and say, but let's just come back to reality. How does this help? Mm. So let's go back to your example or, or rather your point on Alex being integral to life. Right. Today to a child, all of our children are digital natives. They just pick up things and they pick it up very quickly and they're automatically they know how to do things. Right? Yeah. Whether you have a school or you don't have a school, they will still do this. Do we agree? Yes, yes. So you cannot prevent them from acquiring these skills. Yes. They will pick it up. Unless you sort of lock them up and you don't have any digital anything in your house and you forbid them to go to their neighbor's house and those kind of drastic measures, mm. there is no way that a child will not be digitally adept. Right, right. 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 Yeah. right. So that's the second thing is let's again go back to the example of gardening. Now, gardening is the skill we were focusing on. And we are talking about language, math, all of these things, right? We will also talk about how do we ensure that this garden is safe from our basketball game, that the ball doesn't come and destroy something. So we will build protection. Hmm. There is also this point where I will ask, wait a second, we were, built, we, were, we were growing strawberries, but now there are weeds that are coming. How do we ensure that we protect it? Now one is to manually go and pick up the weeds. My next question to you would be, how did you know that was a weed and not a strawberry plant? And you would tell me, I see the difference in the yeah. size and shape of the leaves yes. or the plant. And I say, okay, so basically if I took a photo of this and a photo of that, of the strawberry, and I gave you, you'd be able to tell me which one to pluck and not? Right. So yes, I will be. And then I say, okay, if I was on a video call and the video was focused on the plants, would you be able to tell me which one to pick, uh, pick and not? Yes. Then my next question is, wait a second, if you can do it just on a video call, do you think a machine can be made to do it? And you're like, yeah. So what would the machine need to know? The machine needs to know shape of leaves and different kinds of leaves and what is the right shape and not right shape. What are you getting into? You're getting into data analysis. You're getting into image analysis. You're getting into all of that stuff. Right. So you are getting into technology. And then now you can then say, Anand, if you can do it, why don't we build a little machine that will go through the garden, keep plucking these things correctly and never pluck a strawberry plant. Hmm. And then okay, let's do that. So now I'm building an AI weeder. Yeah. It is artificial intelligence, right? Because it's able to have the intelligence to know which is the weed and which is not the weed. Right. So this doesn't, because I'm acquiring a skill of gardening, it doesn't mean I have to refuse or not see how technology can be used in this space. They all go together. And that is why I'm saying, but now if you noted the skill acquisition was in the context of my gardening. Yeah. Not like, okay, gardening, okay, build a garbage sensor. Like, hmm. why am I building a sensor? That's not yeah. even part of my experience, yeah. right? Because now it is very tight. And when I'm doing this 10, 20 different times, I have a very good understanding of when I want to use technology and when I shouldn't use technology and how to use it and how not to use it. All of those considerations, which normally would not be part of a maker space or an, you know, a tinkering lab or something. Yeah, because there we start with a very specific one-liner definition of that you have to build a... AI weeder system, right? Without actually going into the context of, you know, and then exactly. then we will talk about, then we will take the children into a uh, into a field and teach them the difference between that. And so the, the, the very starting point is different, you know? Exactly. Yeah. That's, what, that's why I'm saying, so all of this is now merged and because they are all centered around the central skill, which is growing of strawberries. Yes, yes. I know. So now I pluck, I can also build a thing to know which when to pluck the strawberry. When is it ripe? When is it not ripe? I can build machines for that also. And then I'm now talking about a lot of things, right? And then there might be someone, a skilled farmer, who comes and says, "Well, your machine is just going and pulling. That's not the right way. It harms the plant." Mm -hmm. And now is teaching me something about a plant, sensitivity towards the plant and not just focusing on getting a strawberry. Right. I'm now focusing on other things as well. Right, right? Right. All of that is possible because it's all in the central context of strawberry plantation or whatever you want. Anything as a matter. Yes, so this is this very interesting. And uh, um, then till this 
this uh, system comes into the mainstream uh, schools how do you suggest parents approach this uh, skill driven education at least in their own uh, you know within their own families within their uh, with their own child in in a very small way as a as a small beginning how do you suggest sure. the parents can go about it sure so firstly what i think parents would need to do is stop treating school as a black box right ki i put a child in and i get a fantastic human being out of it, right that kind of notion should first end which means parents need to have the time today the problem is they don't have the time and or the interest and or the expertise and but they still expect that everyone speak highly of my child and and hence i feel proud about myself i did a great job and all that stuff and hence they they are largely treating the schooling and the education pipeline as a black box i okay, put the child at this end and something fantastic comes out at this end right if if they could go out of that then they will see uh, understand what is the child learning what are the various things that the child is learning and then see okay the child is doing this as learning this and is learning this how can i combine it so you're moving now backward you're not moving forward because the school is not a skill driven school you're moving backward you say okay, the child is learning all of these things let's and all of these things actually all come together in uh, let's just say ceramics let's just say right uh, or, or, or let's say glass blowing right all of these come together in glass blowing because there's colors there's this there is uh, maybe there's some stories that they're studying about human struggle and this that whatever it may be right uh, and occupational hazards or let's say any of those kind of things so i'm seeing all of these and i say glass blow so then i go find anywhere in my vicinity or some place a glass blow right and then take my child on a weekend to meet this person of course after having the agreement of that person that can my child come watch you learn from you i'll pay you for all of that stuff you don't have to do anything different but i'd like to uh you know i'd like you to be my child's mentor teacher for that weekend and then the child immerses themselves in that and and, and you know does a whole can this is one way is then what happens is whatever the child has learned is now suddenly all coming together beautifully in glass blowing as an experience but also they are also getting the skill of glass blowing so the child will now know how to roll the glass on the right. you know the pigment and how to blow at the right pressure you can't just blow right and you can't suddenly start coughing and stuff like that so how do you how do you maintain that how does the lung get affected because of this all of these things uh, and now if you wanted to have a machine do it how would you get a machine to do it right all of these things can be done with the kind of dialogue that parents have with their children around skills um and then the child then starts seeing a lot of these things tied back and then they will keep tying it over time also hmm. three four months later they will suddenly say uh, you know mom i was we, we are studying this but isn't this the same thing that he was doing i right. was doing with uh, right. this thing and uh, you're like actually that that is interesting i didn't think about it that way let's go back and uh, check with him hmm. so the next we can go back to him and say no this time he saw this would that actually apply here and then he confirms it or he clarifies he says nahi nahi lagta to aisa it seems like it but it's not really that it's this variation and then you're like wow i got to learn something hmm. so i think a parent who is a connected with whatever is happening in the child's uh, school experience and actively tries to braid it all together into something nice mm. and have a good relationship with the community can affect some of the values and the benefits of a skill driven education locally at home right right so it's a, it's a doable way provided the parents are ready to invest the time and do a little bit of research and that get get involved with the child to learn that skill because like you mentioned glass blowing skill from there he may have to go into uh, he may have to be introduced to a, a different uh, specialized person to learn the related skills uh, you know and so on 
so yes it is doable and uh, uh, the parents sorry, sorry, sorry. yeah sorry yeah. The reason why i keep insisting on the community is one of the things that most of us uh, children are removed from is the sociological setup of a lot of these things hmm. now, when i go i meet the person who's the glass blower i get to see the kind of lifestyle that they're living the kind of clothes that they're wearing the way they are talked about on the way when you keep asking is so and so you know where is that dukan where is that uh, workshop or whatever you get to see how people talk of him or her yeah yeah right you then see how their economic status is what is the kind of education they are giving their children what is their belief there's so much and maybe even while making that this person is singing a humming a song you know and they say that this song makes the glass lighter mm. and you're like song make a glass lighter <laughs> but you learn these things yes. right there are a lot of these nuanced things like there's this uh, village uh, where they make the tampura mm -hmm. right from gold and all of that stuff there's just so much rich stuff that happens there a person who spends time children who spend time there will come back with an enormous skill mm. which is a dying craft right now but also all of these things they'll understand string tension they'll understand frequencies harmonics everything there's just no end um, and that's what i would say you there's not just the skill there's a lot more that comes along with it which is not possible if you restrict it to the classroom and textbooks i sincerely hope that uh, today's uh, conversation and what uh, wonderful things you have shared uh, make all of us parents and educators realize that uh, there is so much of value in coming out of uh, the classrooms and coming out of the standard textbooks and uh, actually uh, re looking at some of the skills that we have completely kept aside uh, in preference to the cognitive skills right so that is a wonderful uh, uh, conversation i have uh, so many other questions about uh, the implementations and all uh, but i think we'll park them for another session but i would like to have uh, you know uh, one question for uh, you know uh, related to educators that uh, you have done such wonderful research on this um, subject and uh, uh at least i am convinced on the value of uh, skill driven education so if there are any educators who are uh, who want to uh, you know uh, implement uh, this in their setting or want to learn more about it what would be the right way can they approach you are there some resources are there some resources they can refer to how would you what is the way forward for them so first part of your question absolutely i would love to have more educators reach out and do it i'm absolutely at, you know willing to help and i want to help and because this is something i believe in right this is not uh, yeah we we can there are so many ways in which this thing can be done right um, and, and since this is something i would love to see spread this is not something i'm looking at it from a commercial point of view at all this would be something that i would really love to see spread throughout the world the other bit is do they have resources now very frankly I, in all of my research i haven't come across anyone implementing the skill driven education the, the definition that i have given right i haven't so in many ways i seem to uh, feel that it's it's original research and work that is being done so given that it is nascent and it's in an original state there is no reason why teachers can't explore also on their own they might want starting things they might say wait a second uh, we have a basket weaver here i don't understand how basket weaving can be combined with science and maths we can have a dialogue about it and i can show how basket weaving can be used in our class and once you get into that train of thinking right i don't see why anyone can't pick it up for everything it just comes for everything there's nothing right now in your room that can't be picked up let's say even the calendar that you have the calendar design and making could be a skill and from there i can teach all of maths and science and uh, history and geography and economics right. and everything right so i think it's really about doing it and trying it up um and that's it's not just for skill development i tell you very honestly right even if you look at normal teaching and cognitive skills one of the whenever i used to uh, interview educators etc i would ask them very very real things i uh, things like i say okay where do you live they let's say they say they, i live in nagpur i said okay, you step out of your house and you walk down what do you see 
someone will say, I see a banyan tree, I see a Kiranaka Dukan, I see a garbage bin. I'm like, wait, wait, garbage bin? Okay. Can you uh, walk up to the garbage bin? And then they're mentally walking up to the garbage bin. I say, okay, you know, you're standing in front of this entire garbage pile. Uh, can you construct a lesson on probability using only this garbage pile? Now, if the teacher is not able to do that, to me, it's a sense of they don't believe that their own subject is relevant. Right? Most of the people will look at it and they'll say something and they'll try and all of this stuff, but they're not able to. When you point it out, they suddenly it all makes sense to them. But then you take them to a new context and you ask them the same question, they're like, what can you possibly, there's nothing here to do with geometry. I'll say, okay, tell, let's take your washing machine and your washing clothes. Can you please tell me uh, what's the geometry involved? And they'll be like, geometry? I don't know, shape of the machine. I said, yeah, go, keep going, keep going. And then it's that. I think this is an extremely important skill for teachers to have. Else they will not be able to give the experiential learning that they're talking about or real world examples that they talk about, so on and so forth. So even there you need it. Skill driven, so definitely you need it. So I'm absolutely happy to collaborate with anyone who wants to try it out. Very, very happy to do that. Um, and if, if schools want this thing to be tried out, I'm more than happy to, uh, travel to the school and help them implement themselves. Wonderful, wonderful. So we'll be sharing uh, your uh, email ID with the audiences and, uh, you know, I hope our audience is uh, um, able to have some takeaways from uh, today's session and then have this uh, immense curiosity to explore this subject further and uh, you can always uh, reach uh, Mr. Anand at the, uh, at the shared uh, email address and uh, pick his brains and, you know, get him on board to try a pilot at your uh, school or at your, at your place. So that would be a good uh, starting point. Absolutely. Right. So it was wonderful to uh, have you on board today and to discuss this uh, new subject. Uh, I really look forward to this being uh, implemented and, uh, you know, I would also like to be part of it and, uh, uh, we will also, you know, bring uh, forth another session wherein we go deeper into the implementation aspects of uh, this. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me, Kathleen. This is really nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving your time. Thank you. All right. Have a lot.